We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. AEW Unrestricted. Will Washington. It's Aubrey Edwards. How are you, Aubrey? I'm doing great. It's such an exciting time. I've somehow gotten enough sleep after all of the craziness that was Revolution. What an exciting show. What an emotional show. Absolutely nuts. I don't know how like we keep outdoing ourselves with pay-per-views, but somehow we did it. We did it. And it feels like a whole new era of AEW all of a sudden. Right. We've got new dynamite. We've got new rampage. We have got the feeling, Aubrey. Have, do you have you gotten the feeling? I've had the feeling, but the feeling's been renewed. It's 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 there. I love it. Like, I, dude, and we're we're just killing it on TV. Like, I love everything that's happening. I love all the storylines we have in play. I love that we've got all of these awesome women's matches happening on TV. I love that we've got big business happening. Uh, like, it, it, literally, right? this is just going to be such a cool time. And I'm so looking forward to everything we've got going forward. We've just got so many good things happening in AEW constantly and from like both an on-screen persona, but as someone backstage seeing all of these people's success, it's been so cool to see everyone just thriving and taking a hold of these opportunities and just finding all of the success. And speaking of which, Will, who do we have today? Hate to play favorites here, but it's one of my personal favorites here at AEW. And I'm so glad that he recently was given the all elite treatment he is the one and only bounty hunter, Brian Keith. I'm here to rip faces off. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> dear Lord. <laughs> it's too early for that. <laughs> I wake up ripping faces off. Just uh. I need at least two cups of coffee before I can rip a face off. So I, I commend your, your energy right out of the gate, sir. <laughs> I, I am so glad we have you here. I'm so glad that we get to, to talk to you and have you here in AEW officially. As a matter of fact, I want to start there. It start with the fact that uh, not too long ago, you got the All Elite graphic. You got the All Elite treatment. You had big match with Eddie Kingston. Uh, that was, of course, on the February 3rd collision post-match. Uh, you were greeted by Tony Schiavone. And Aww. you've got the All Elite graphic right there on the screen. Uh, that was in Edinburgh, Texas. That's right. I was right there with you. Uh, I saw we were in the airport. Uh, and we were... You were guiding me through buying Whataburger breakfast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so tell me about that night. Tell me about everything that happened leading up to that and and how that moment felt. It was a dream come true, man. I, I, for, I've been wanting to wrestle Eddie Kingston for forever. I was supposed to wrestle him like three other times, three other um, matches that got canceled or just didn't happen or something like that. So the anticipation for me wrestling him was super high. Uh, and then, like you said, I'm coming from coming off the tour, going to DDT in Japan, another place that I've dreamed of going for my whole life. I knew it was going to be a great time in Japan, but it, I, it exceeded every expectation. I experienced everything, even experienced an earthquake for the first time. That was wild. Very crazy time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have all the questions about your Japan experience. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. We'll, we'll get, get there. there. We'll get... But yeah, so. Um, and then, you know, just leading up to me having the work, having the match with Hangman, having the match with. Orange Cassidy and all the other opportunities I had with ROH and AEW. And those were just opportunities that fell into my lap because, you know, my friend here, Will Washington, was keeping me in close knit, letting me know when opportunities would come around. You know, uh, I was just blessed that I was able to go and capitalize on every opportunity that was given to me, every uh, chance that I got. And it all led up to this one moment wrestling Eddie Kingston in, of all places, Texas territory. And the fans were hot. They were one. And you know how we do it in Texas, man. Fans like the wrestling, uh, super hard hitting in your face, very electric, very uh, exciting. And uh, I believe that that's what me and Eddie Kingston delivered that night. A Texas barn burner, man. Uh, classic match. I was not expecting the fans to be, but I, okay. I, I know every time we're in Texas, I'm almost like pleasantly surprised at just how hot the fans are in that particular area. But uh, when we were in Edinburgh, which is just outside of McAllen, it was just this raw energy with these fans. They were so loud from the opening match. And I'm talking about before Collision, before Ring of Honor, just our opening dark matches. Everything was just hot, hot, hot from the very beginning. 
Uh, they were super electric for you guys. They were giving you and Eddie every single thing they had. I think it made that moment for you that much more hot. Just it was it felt like it was on fire. How did you feel with those particular fans in that area? Man, it was great. And um, what's even crazier is that McAllen is like, there's not too much wrestling that happens in McAllen. You know, there's not too many indie companies that run out of McAllen or even around that area. It's kind of like far out the way. I guess it's, it's like six hours away from me. I'm in Houston. And uh, for them to be that hot, you know, of course, they're that hot because there's not so much wrestling. But for them to so many people to show up and pack that arena the way it was, it's like it just shows you, you know, that for that to be a lighter a lighter Texas area, a lighter Texas city where wrestling doesn't happen as much there, that much energy was still coming out of, you know, just a lighter Texas crowd. And, you know, when you go on to Houston, Dallas, Austin, these bigger places, the crowds are, are hot, you know, they're just as excited too. And it's Texas, we love wrestling, man. If you think of like so many great wrestlers that have came out of Texas, Booker T, Mark Henry, uh, Von Eriks, freaking the Funk, Stan Hansen, just everybody, man, Paul London, freaking – Brian Danielson even wrestled in Texas for uh for a while, you know. So it's definitely a place where we love our wrestling. There's like what football. <laughs> I feel like it's football, <laughs> baseball, football, too. and barbecue. And barbecue too, and then and, and, and wrestling. <laughs> and so yeah, we love it, man. It's it's amazing. I want to go back a little bit and talk about sort of your first introduction to the AEW audience. I don't remember where it was. I'm sure Will remembers off the top of his head, but I remember that day hearing about how we were giving you a pre-tape and then you had a match. That was in Chicago, wasn't it? I did. Yes. There you go. Yep, yep, there yep. you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, I was going to know. But I know said. exactly why that was. You wrestled Hangman Adam Page. Yep. Which makes so much sense in the world. You have the bounty hunter. You have the cowboy. Like, oh, so great. I remember getting to tell you about that. I remember breaking it to you and your, your face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your face when you're like, I'm wrestling who? Yeah. Former world champion. No big deal. <laughs> so I, I remember getting to tell you about that, but I distinctly remember where it was, mainly because of conversations we had had before that, where uh, we were just we had been trying to find like where the right place for you was going to be. And when we you were going to be in the same place we were and you happened to have dates in Chicago all out week. Mm -hmm. That's what. It yep. Was. Yeah. Yep. Let, let's talk about that night, that that week and what everything led up to that week. Man, like you said, I had other dates that week for, you know, just wrestling on my own. And a lot of the times just being so busy like that, it gets overwhelming because you're like, man, not only do I have, you know, all these indie dates that I got lined up, I got a big opportunity lined up. I don't really know what's to expect of it. It's my first time. It was my first time even doing AEW work, period. It was overwhelming, but at the same time, very calming because everybody knew who I was. And, you know, I was getting this opportunity where the, it was pretty much specified for me. Like, yes, I'm coming in as the bounty hunter, a guy that I am, I created, I built myself. And not only am I coming in as myself, I'm acknowledged as, hey, you know what will be a good fit for you going against our hangman Adam Page. And I'm like, bro, that's like, it's perfect. It couldn't happen any more perfectly. And like, it was honestly unreal for me, but at the same time, like I said, very common because it made it seem like, you know what, like, I feel like I, I'm i wanted here and not only am I wanted here, I'm put in a position where I have the capability, the opportunity to just kill it and be a part of everything else. So, like, I am I was happy, man. I remember just walking away that night, just like taking it all in and be like, man, this is like the culmination of me wrestling 13, 14 years and just, you know, finally being able to feel and be myself. And not only be myself, but be appreciated for who this what I've created for myself these past years. So it was uh, definitely a blessing, man. So that's the thing I love. And I love your outlook about it, because I feel like in order to like air quotes, make it, it's a combination of opportunity and talent and hard work and all of those things. And you've got the talent, you've got the hard work. It's just a matter of where is the opportunity coming from? Mm -hmm. And as you said, like AEW extra talent work, it's always kind of like you, you're showing up, you have no idea what you're doing. You might end up filling a seat. You might running like memory cards for the camera guys. Like who knows what security, like you have no idea what you're doing. And then to be thrown an opportunity and to thrive in that opportunity was so cool to see because uh, admittedly, I, I was somewhat familiar with you, but I hadn't seen a lot of your work. But as soon as someone is given like, oh, we have this extra here who's given a pre-tape. 
okay, this guy's legit. Like I just immediately know and I trust everyone who's in charge of creative <laughs> that they're like, okay, no, they know what they're doing. This is awesome. This is freaking great. And then watching the match, I'm like, this guy's awesome. They didn't make you change your character at all. They made you just be you. Oh. And it was so incredible to watch that success story take place. And as soon as it was done, I was like, oh, this guy's going to be here eventually, but it's just a matter of time. Like, we just got to find the spot. It's great. So congrats, man. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you know it was funny. Uh, I, I'll even pull a little bit back on that one. A little bit of backstory is that you and I had been talking for quite some time. I'm going to give credit to one person who I think deserves the most credit for getting you here, anybody. And that was Darius Martin. Yes, sir. Nice. Who came to me one day. I remember, I can't remember what city we were in, but we were outside a hotel and Darius Martin comes up to me and he goes, what's it going to take to get Brian Keith in here? Yeah. So we were trying to coordinate schedules and I asked you where you were going to be that lined up with where we were going to be. And I, I sent you our travel dates or our tour dates. And then you were like, well, I'm going to be in Chicago on this week. And I was like, okay, come to the show that week. Yeah. That was where Tony Khan walked in that day. You know, of course, when Tony walks into the arena, um, he, of course, has to pass by all the extras. And he saw you there. Hell and yes. When he comes into the creative room, immediately he's like, we got to get Brian Keith on TV. I didn't know he was going to be here. Because <laughs> for some reason, I had forgotten to mention that. I had literally forgotten in everything that I was in getting you set and getting you squared away and getting you here. I had forgotten to actually say something to the boss that you were going to be. <laughs> Just that one critical so, element. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, that one critical element. And so he walked in, saw you with the extras and was like, he's going to be on TV tonight. And that's it. And so like Tony deserves more credit than anybody uh, as this is his company. But literally it was Tony Khan that saw you and said, He's going to be facing Hangman Adam Page tonight. In some capacity, he's going to face Hangman Adam Page. Tony Khan was uh, the one who had the vision for that. And that was, and th it was almost like if nothing else is happening tonight, it is Hangman Adam Page versus Brian Keith. Yeah, yeah that was phenomenal, man. Shout out to Tony. Shout out to Darius for sure. That's my brother, man. It's, it's been a blessing. It's been an honor, man. And AEW is like, uh, it's life changing for me, man. Ever since I joined, man, it's been nothing but up, just positivity, creativity. Everything's been fun, man. And I'm excited to get started, man. Well, we are so excited to have you here. And I think there's so much more we could talk about. We've got so many other stories that we can get to uh, with your career. And it's all going to happen right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, Will Washington, Aubrey Edwards, and the bounty hunter, Brian Keith here, one of our newest additions to the AEW roster. He's had an incredible run so far, and I'm so excited to see his trajectory in this company and his growth after all of the grinding he's been doing on the indies for years. I think you had mentioned in our first segment, you've been wrestling for 13, 14 years? Yeah, about 13, 14 years, yep. Wow! So, so what was your introduction to wrestling like? So my... Uncle used to uh, babysit me while my parents were working and he would throw on uh, old Coliseum VHS tapes. And that was like my introduction to wrestling was watching those VHS tapes. And I just remember my mom always not wanting me to watch them because she was like, why are you showing him this? He shouldn't be seeing that. And little did she know in the midst of me watching those VHS, I got bit by the wrestling bug and just never let it go. So since like I was like 10 or 11 years old, I was always like, man, when I grow up, I want to be a professional wrestler. I remember they had career day at school and like uh, everybody supposedly every day picked like fireman and policeman and stuff. And the guys were like, man, you're the first kid today to pick professional wrestler. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And he was like, I got something special for you. Guy comes back with like a tag team championship and they throw a backdrop behind me. And it was like Macho Man in the NWO colors. Like, is it me and him were coming out to the ring together? And I was like, bro, this is amazing. So like, you know, 10 year old me doing like the rocks eyebrow and like, you know, <laughs> <it's so cozy. laughs> Getting ready for what was about to happen, but uh, I have like a picture of me in my house of like um, I'm Brian, you know uh, Keith. When I grow up, I want to be a professional wrestler. I'm ten years old. My favorite thing to do is play PlayStation Two and stuff like that. So uh, I also like just to interject how this whole conversation has dated you because you've said PS Two and VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old man, but kind of not really. I'm a young man, but an old man. We're kind of all the same age at this point. I'm I'm picking up on that. Anyway, continue. <laughs> yes, yeah. Around 11, 12 years old, um, I started seeing there was um, a company around Houston 
called PWA at the time. It was PWA, born. yeah. Shout out to PWA, the right yep. behind the bowling alley. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my former co-host on my first podcast I did was from Houston, and he used to be just one of the regulars at PWA. He was always at PWA shows, and he would always talk about. He'd always do his Booker T impersonation, and he'd be like, "Come see us right behind the bowling alley." And so, like, yep. I've always <laughs> had that stuck in my head with PWA shows, and uh, it's something I've never forget. Gotten shout out, Paul Griffin. Yeah, heck yeah. So that was my first introduction to just wrestling, period. Like, my, um, I never went to any of the bigger shows because, you know, my parents just didn't have time. They were always working. So I would go with a friend of mine that was a neighbor, and we would go to the PWA shows. And um, one time, his parents couldn't take us. So my friend, he was like 12, and he drives. So <laughs> very Texas. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take the van and we're going to drive up to PWA and watch some wrestling. So, um, we watched the show. We left the lights on in the van and the battery died in the van. So we just were stuck and we had to fight, get our parents or well, his parents to come and get me because my parents didn't know. My parents found out about this like four years ago. I just told them. About it. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was like, yeah, I probably shouldn't tell that story too much. But <laughs> his parents were going to come pick us up and um who was the person there to help us for, you know, for us to wait there as minors. It was Booker T. He was sitting there signing autographs and just waiting with the fans afterwards. And I came up to him and was like, Hey, you know, let him know the situation. And he let us stay there until our parents got there and just visit with the wrestlers and stuff. And after it was done, we were like, man, one day we're going to come back and we're going to wrestle for you. And then um, on my journey, you know, I started a, a place called Texas all-star wrestling here in Houston, Texas wrestled there for like a good three or four years and then eventually went to PWA, which was Booker T's reality of wrestling, which is now. And um, I'm one of the trainers there now. So it's kind of like full circle for me to just meet him, have that interaction with him and not only tell him, Hey, am I going to come back and wrestle for you? The same building that that happened in, I won my first championship for his promotion in a steel cage. Wow. Match, so that was even crazier. You know, even now, you know, he's a, definitely a mentor to me, but more of like a, a a family member at this point you know he's definitely been there at all points of my career even now with the signing and everything and been super supportive and just super knowledgeable of everything and um it's, it's crazy man it's definitely my life is like a movie you know every day i wake up and i'm like wow i just can't believe it i'm pinching myself because you know it's just all of everything has led me to what it is i'm living out now so yeah, I, I love that that Booker in everything, considering he is absolutely signed somewhere else, uh, has yeah. been so supportive of you. Like literally, uh, I was not expecting him uh, when you had the match with Hangman to tweet our graphic uh, with the hashtag signed Brian Keith. Yeah, he said, give that man that contract. <laughs> yeah, give that man that contract, and like that's cool. Like he's literally on the other show, and he's promoting our product and telling us. Hey, you got to sign Brian Keith. Like, I, I thought that was great. And I thought that was a movie probably didn't have to do, but it kind of showed how supportive he's been of your career. Definitely. He's always been super supportive and, and always there for me to ask questions or just learn stuff from literally the, the guy I am today. The wrestler I am today is because of the good Lord upstairs and Booker T, you know, God has graced me with the opportunity and Booker T has given me the knowledge and I've just been able to use it all. So, oh, well, let's talk about the, the character, the bounty hunter. That came from a suggestion from Booker? Yeah, that was exactly from Booker. You know, I'm from Texas, so I love the Von Erics, love the Funks, love, love Stan Hansen. So what did I come up with? I'm going to be a cowboy. You know, I'd come out with like a lumberjack shirt and a cowboy hat. And, you know, it was more like um, Japanese strong style meets Texas strong style. And I just mixed them together. I was had the influence of the Japanese style, but just the representation of Texas. And uh, I just remember him being like, I like what you got, but it just needs something more. It needs something with a stamp on it. And uh, the way he presented it to me was there's a show called The Rifleman and it has Sammy Davis Jr. in it. And Sammy Davis Jr. is a bounty hunter. He's a black bounty hunter. And he was like, man, I've never really seen a black bounty hunter in wrestling before. You know, I think it's something you should try out. He never really gave me like a clear direction to go with or something to do. But he was always like, hey, watch this or hey, look at this. And. The more research I started doing, it was even crazy because my dad is like a huge fan of cowboy pictures. He loves cowboy films. Whenever he was younger, uh, he's from California. And uh, all he would do was just, you know, sneak into the theaters with his uh, brothers and they'd go watch cowboy films the whole day. My dad really is the one who pressed me to start watching like Tombstone, um, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly trilogy, 
um, Once Upon a Time in the West, all like these like classic Western films. My dad was pushing on me and was like, hey, man, you know, I watch those films all the time. You should take a look. And he's right. My dad would watch those films all the time when I was younger. And I'd be like, oh, why, why are you watching this? I want to watch wrestling, you know, but it's kind of crazy, like full circle nowadays. Those films that he was watching that I thought were born and stuff like they're masterpieces, man. I go back and I watch now and I'm like, man, these films are great. Like, I don't even watch movies, bro. The only thing I do is play PlayStation, work out and watch wrestling. That's all I do. But, you know, every now and then I throw in a little cowboy film just to relax and, you know, kick it with my family and watch that stuff. But it's wild how those movies just like tell such intricate stories for you to just be in, in immersed in for so long. You know, some of these cowboy films are like three hours long and they're the whole time I'm on the edge of my seat. So I like to draw things from those and just like learn so much from them because as, as far as like just media goes, like entertainment, you know, they're really great things to get behind. So. So what was the thing that clicked to go from cowboy to bounty hunter? It was a mix of me just mixing everything that I love. So like, um, like I said, I'm in love with Japanese professional wrestling. So I, I had that as like a foundation. And then I had the Westernness that I was learning from my father or from Booker T that was, you know, throwing out these suggestions. Then I worked at Hot Topic for a while and I got into <laughs> hardcore music, like metal music so much. Like I, it, before I worked at Hot Topic, I was only a strictly rap guy. All I listened was rap, R&B a little bit. But I started working at Hot Topic when I was in like 10th grade. And uh, ended up being a manager and working there for forever. I just got so in love with hardcore and metal music. So I just started pulling, you know, stuff from that world and, you know, the more darker tones and things. And then, of course, me being from Texas and being a wrestler, you know, Undertaker is a guy that he's the reason, honestly, that I liked wrestling. When my uncle put it in the VHS Coliseum tape, it was Undertaker with the vulture on his arm is what got me. And I was like, man, that dude is so cool. I want to be like that guy. And like, it's crazy. Just like full circle. Here it is now. I'm the supernatural bounty hunter, you know, like Undertaker was just a supernatural dead man, but it was a gunslinger. And that's what I, you know, homage to Undertaker is, you know, a possessed bounty hunter is what I like to call myself, you know. But um, it's just taking all these things and putting them together, uh, mixing also the Houston culture. I was on the Indies wrestling and um, I remember once I had different music, but nothing really clicked. And then one time someone was playing still tipping before a wrestling show switcher house and, and i'm sponsored by switcher house only sponsored switcher house athlete ever which which is one of the next questions by the way so <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about it all we could talk about yeah it. we're gonna talk about it all so we're, we're gonna get there for people waiting for the switcher house story ah. yeah yeah so they played it before uh one of the shows and just fans reacted to it so well and i was like man maybe i'm gonna come out to still tipping tonight and when it hit, man, it just hit perfectly and it went with my character and everything and like just the grittiness of Texas and like the almost like the grittiness of my matches. You know, I like to be very hard hitting and just in your face. And it just like the the song still tipping when it hits, it's just banger as soon as it hits. You hear the little violin, you know, it kind of creeps you in. But then once the the, the freaking uh, Slim Thug hops in and, you know, just starts first verse right out the gate, it just gives you that gritty Houston energy. So I was just mixing that. Houston culture mixed with the Japanese culture mixed with the metal culture and Texas culture. Just all that little melting pot is what creates Brian Keith, the bounty hunter. Well, let's talk about Swisher house. Yes. Uh, you've gotten to use still tipping both in ring of honor and uh, on AEW TV, which I thought was just such a cool moment. Uh, there's probably an untellable story of how that all came to be, <laughs> uh, but it was so cool that we, we got to do that. Uh, getting to use it, particularly in Texas. Yeah. It's one of those songs, I think pretty much anywhere you play it, everybody knows it. But in Texas, it's going to get a pop. It's the anthem, baby. You got to stand up and put your hand over your chest. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it hit, everybody goes nuts. There's such a big pop. I remember I was, I, it was so loud, I didn't hear what song had played when it played, but I just hear the crowd going nuts. And I was like, wow, that was really loud. And then once they start to come down, I'm like, oh, Brian Keith is coming out, and uh, it, it was great. It was, again, just a really cool moment. But uh, I want to talk about how the Swish House relationship came to be and how that led to you using Still Tipping as the song everybody associates with you. The guys that create the Swish House merchandise, you know, print, everything, pack up. You know, if you're ordering stuff off the website, these are the guys sending it out to you. Those guys I grew up with, they're like um, my literally... The homies I grew up with from the neighborhood and 
I've always known that they created the merchandise. I just never really, you know, I, I even help. I help press some of the stuff, everything, CDs and everything, sell some stuff, doing this in the midst of, you know, my indie schedule, working everything for years, man. One day we were hanging out and I was like, man, you know, it'd be cool to be like sponsored by Switch House, like an athlete, like a, you know, sponsored athlete. Switch House. I'm thinking of like NASCAR, you know, where you get the jacket and they got the patches on it. And I'm just like, man, that'd be cool to come out with like the old school All Japan, like capital jacket, but they had a Switch House patch on it, you know, like. And that's just me thinking like to myself, being a mark for myself. <laughs> but, <laughs> Someone has to be. <laughs> if, some, if somebody's going to be a mark for myself, I should be, right? <laughs> so I was, you know, I pitched it to him and my friend was like, man, look, we'll just ask G-Dash. G-Dash is the guy who owns the company. He owns a piece of the company. He ran it by him and then they got back to me maybe like a week later and they were like, yeah, man, I think he wants to go through with it. And I just remember, man, I was like so happy, dog. Like they, they gave me a bunch of like Switch House shirts hoodies, hats, beanies, everything, like, as far as, like, a little, like, almost like a signing package, sent it to me, and, you know, we made a big deal of it on social media, and just, I remember it popping on social media, but then, you know, wrestling's kind of iffy, so people were just kind of like, uh, I don't think this guy really signed by Switch House, you know, a lot of people just make claims on the internet, and it was like, you know, we'll see what's up, but I feel like that's something you can't really go lying about, you know, you're throwing out Switch House's name like that in Texas, Amongst, you know, people that are I'm in the rap, com- I'm not in the rap community because I'm not a rapper myself. But, you know, Texas is big, but it's very small. So if you're trying to find somebody that you're looking for, you can run into them easily. So <laughs> I wouldn't just be out here laying claim to something like that, just, you know, falsifying or whatever. But it's been really cool, man, because like they'll have um community events like they'll do fundraisers or they'll do concerts or, you know, just regular pop ups where they sell merchandise and they allow me to come through and sign autographs and have people take pictures with the championships that I may have and stuff stuff like that. So it was like, it was a real cool taste of just like what wrestling was going to be like for me before getting to the stage where I'm at now, you know, like in, for them to just take me in and allow me to be part of the switch house family and be, uh, like I said, again, part of the event. Some of these guys are pulling up. It's like, what well, is a rap event? What is that guy over there sitting with that wrestling championship at the table for or whatever? But I just feel like it was a cool opportunity for us to merge both, crowds because a lot of the times you know that's untapped potential people don't really understand it wrestling and rapping go hand in hand you know especially like the grinding part of it all like having your own mixtape or your own merchandise and selling it out the back of your trunk that's what switch house was known for it was like just grinding if you don't work you don't eat you don't grind you don't shine so like they were always selling their merchandise out of their trunks or selling cds you know giving away cds and honestly that's the same for me as a professional wrestler i'm always grinding selling my merchandise working out every day, doing what it takes to just make sure at the end of the day, you cross all T's and dotted all I's. And you can say that when you make it, or even if you don't make it, you did everything you could to, you know, make that possible. So I just feel like that culture of the rap culture and the wrestling culture is so, it merges so well together just somehow, sometimes. And that actually, honestly, that's a big thing that AEW does so well. I feel like, you know, releasing the album AEW rap, uh, I want to say you guys like rap album and stuff like that. Who we are, who we are. Yeah, yeah exactly. And who we are, volume two, by the way. Exactly. It's volume two, and there's there's more opportunity for it. And it's showing people that when you're bringing these cultures together, it's, it's just keeping both things alive, you know? Because as far as entertainment goes, it's not the entertainment's not needed, but it's like, okay, well, whenever COVID happened, like, you know, people who were important were working because the world was, they needed them entertainment was still going because it was something to have people's mind you know take off people's minds and stuff like that but it's like things are so so few and far between you know if it's not a necessity it won't be around so much but i feel like pushing into the people who support these things and allowing us to just tap into different cultures and different audiences and just giving that life and giving that love to something it allows us to stay around longer and just have more success and it's, it's just better for everybody man better for the whole business I'm freaking like just sitting here just enthralled by everything you're saying and like <laughs> so positive and so amazing. And there's so much more to talk about here on AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Will Washington, it's Aubrey Edwards, but it's also the bounty hunter, Brian Keith. Brian, you talked about growing up and being a big fan of Japanese wrestling and incorporating that into your style. And one of the things we just touched on earlier in the show was that you got to take a trip to Japan, wrestling DDT. How was that experience for you? How was that full circle moment for you? 
Man, yeah. Hey, first of all, shout out to my DDT boys. I love DDT with all my heart, man. Those guys are amazing. Showed me a great time, and I can't wait to go back and work with them. But um, like you said, I've been watching rest, Japanese professional wrestling since I was like, I want to say since I was like 14, 13, because I didn't really know about it right out the gate. I, I only watched uh, American wrestling. I remember my first introduction to Japanese wrestling, though, was watching Brian Danielson versus Jushin Liger. What a way to start. Oh, my God. <laughs> Who is this guy that looks like a Power Ranger? I was like, man, he is giving <laughs> Brian Danielson the business, dog. Because <laughs> at the time, Brian Danielson was my favorite wrestler. You know, 14 years old, 15 years old, that's the guy I was watching, you know, because he was just ripping it up everywhere. He was on a legendary indie run. So I dipped in further, found out about Jushin Thunder Liger, ended up just snowballing and finding more guys, Toshiaki Kawada, Tenru, all these guys that now that I know as a older guy is like, man, these guys are legends. And I couldn't believe I was taking so long in my life to find out about them all. Even to this day, I found about so many guys that I didn't even know about and they're just blowing my mind. I love Japanese professional wrestling, but um, this DDT opportunity came along and, uh, Shout out to my guy, Shota. Shota at DDT is one of the guys that was showing me around, helping me out, helping uh, me get the visa and get everything squared away so that everything could be legit. The opportunity to go to DDT came and I ran to it, man, as quick as I could. It was a dream of mine to go to Japan. And I had expectations going in like, OK, this is going to be great. You're going to enjoy it. But everything that I experienced, everything that I went through, that I witnessed just blew me out of the water way better than I thought. I was there for two weeks, but every day was like a dream, man. Literally every day I was waking up and I was like, man, this I can't believe this is happening. I would wake up some days and forget I was in Japan and just like, oh, I'm waking up, you know, in the U.S. And like, no, you're still in this hotel in Japan for two weeks. <laughs> every day I was gone from the hotel. I wasn't there, you know, hanging out or just chilling. You know, I brought my switch just in case, you know, I'd be like to pass time, but I didn't even need it literally at all. Every day I was doing something different, seeing something different, eating something different. The food there is phenomenal. I didn't feel bloated after eating nothing. In fact, after eating all day and then walking, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd have abs, bro. And I was like, what is this life, <laughs> what is this life I'm living, dog? So I got to go to Japan is what you're saying. That's the secret. <laughs> it was amazing. You just got to eat a bunch of beef and rice and delicious other Japanese food and, and walk multiple times in a day and you'll wake up freaking strong baby but i was enjoying every moment of it i got to wrestle in cork and hall a uh, definitely a legendary venue all some of my favorite matches that i've watched in japanese professional wrestling have taken place in cork and hall for me to be there and present my package what i have as a professional wrestler to the people at cork and hall and to take it in and receive it well i was tag teaming with damnation which is a tag team in ddt that's kind of like it's crazy because they honestly have the same aesthetic as I do. Literally, they're just not like cowboys or anything like that. But they're like super scary looking and their gear matched my gear. And I was like, bro, we're a match made in heaven, dog. But it was cool for us to just have that six man in Cork and Hall. And then I had the one on one match with Mao. And um, it was a Prince Hotel, I think was the name of it. I don't know where it is in Tokyo, but uh, we had the one on one. And I hate to just keep using the phrase dream come true. But when you're I'm watch when I'm watching these Japanese matches, usually the crowd's quiet. You hear like, you know, cameras going off and people clapping and like, you know, random Japanese women in the background screaming like people's names like, Mao, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, this is exactly what was happening while the match was taking place between me and Mao. And like, I was just like, I remember he gave me a Michinoku off the top rope. Bam, big cover. One, two, I kick out. And I just remember taking a, st- uh, uh, a moment and just breathing and looking up the lights and being like, man, bro, like, I did get just dumped on my head, but I just got dumped on my head in the middle of Japan. (laughs) And I just remember hearing all the, like, camera flicks go off and the women, Japanese women in the background, Mao, BK, like, just going off and, like, you know, the claps for whenever we do things ridiculously crazy. And it was definitely a dream come true, man. It was an opportunity and, like, an experience I'll always hold, you know, very close in my heart and my life, man. It was uh, it was crazy. You you talk about your life being a movie and it just all of these stories feel very, very movie like the fact that uh, 12 years old going to indie wrestling shows and getting the opportunity to work with Booker T, a guy that you had seen on TV, a Houston legend, all the way to getting to wrestle in Japan after that being one of your your passions and your dreams working with Swisha House. You know, we haven't even gotten to talk about the, the family life and the, the things at home. And uh, how has this last year been for 
the entire family for you. Man, it's been unreal, very unreal. Because a lot of the times, you know, my mom and my dad, not that they weren't supportive of wrestling, but they just didn't see it as a thing that was like possible because they just didn't know anybody who was a wrestler. So they were like, every time I told them when I wanted to be a wrestler, they were like, oh, you know, great dream, kid. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like they didn't know what it was going to take, but they were just always like, you know, like, oh, maybe you want to do something better or, oh, you want to do something different. And it was like, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep is the only thing on my mind, the only thing in my heart besides my family. It was just a dream I couldn't let go. When I was in school, man, I was a straight A student. I graduated number 22 out of 700 something kids, like pretty freaking high. I could have went to any college I wanted to full ride if I pursued it. What did I choose to do? Go to community college, <laughs> then go to wrestling and start uh literally my mom was like I, I was bugging her i was 17 and i wanted to start i was 16 17 going to like some seminars going to some practices and i was like i just want to do this wrestling thing you know they were i was getting ready to graduate and they were like well where do you want to go what do you want to do and i remember telling them i wanted to go to drexel university because it was the only university that i saw was close enough to ring of honor in philadelphia and i was like well i'll just go to drexel tell my parents i'm going to drexel but end up going to ring of honor <laughs> and just train there <laughs> but when i told my parents about leaving out of state they were kind of like uh i don't think you should do that just yet maybe you want to stay somewhere that's close enough you know just so you know we can keep in contact and stuff like that and i was just like you know what I'm going to just go to community college until I figure it all out. So I remember going to community college and doing like my first two years there, but still wrestling. And then wrestling just started taking off for me more. And I just started finding more and more jobs that would supplement my wrestling just because I always knew like, you know, everybody was like, oh, you always have to have a plan B. But I'm like, if I got a plan B, that's going to distract me from my plan A. I need to be full force in that plan A so that I know there's I did everything I could to make it. I did everything I could to just make the opportunity happen for myself. Every job that I had, you know, I had g great jobs to where they were like, hey, man, you know, we want to make you a boss. We want to make you a manager. We're thinking about doing this. And I'm kind of like, uh, man, I do this thing on the weekends where, you know, <laughs> I probably can't be around here too much often. But um, looking back on it, I'm glad I made every decision I did. I'm glad I bet it on me. And here I am now in all elite wrestling, ready to give everybody hell, man. Everybody. <laughs> so I love this story because, like, I feel like everything is full circle. Yeah. And everything is also just, like, the template for if you grind and you wait long enough and you put the time in and you dedicate all of your attention to yourself, eventually good stuff happens. And I love when good stuff happens to good people. And just like all of these little moments, like one of my favorite moments was, I think it was a press conference for Russell Dream, but Brian mentions you as like this guy that's, Great. and it's it's funny to hear you talk about like, oh yeah, Brian, like this guy in Ring of Honor and Indie Run. And then all of a sudden this like friggin' legend is just mentioning you casually in a press conference. <laughs> just to touch on that, not to interrupt you, but... Brian Danielson has been one of my favorite wrestlers since I was like 13, 14 years old. I have the first time Ring of Honor came to Houston ever. The first time they came was in the George R. Brown Convention Center. And I still got the program where he signed it for me. And not only did he sign my program, initially the main event was about to start and I saw him over to the side. So I ran over there and I had a PWI magazine. And I was like, man, I need Brian Danielson to sign my PWI magazine. Ran over there, asked him if he could sign it. And in the midst of me just like talking to him, Ended up just shooting it, you know, with him. And he was like, hey, well, you want to watch the main event together? And I was like, hey, yeah. Me and Brian Danielson are chilling while talking about wrestling, watching Jerry Lynn versus Nigel McGuinness go at it. and ring Dude, it. which is, again, just a full circle moment thinking about AEW. It's crazy, man. Literally, uh, the first time I cried in professional wrestling for somebody who wasn't me was like when he had to retire and he hurt his neck you know like that was like yep it was pretty serious because here's the dude that i like you know i think all three of us cried <laughs> at that moment but only one famously, of us was on yes. camera doing it yeah one, <laughs> famously one <yes>. very famously <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it just like uh it, i just remember it touching me so much man because he was a guy that i watched and was just like he made me feel like i could do it watching him was like you know what it's possible you know anything's possible as long as you put your mind to it and amongst other guys that i would watch but he was definitely a guy who i was it just stuck in my mind and of course the different instances of meeting him i met him there and i met him a couple of other times doing extra work at other companies where he worked at and we were always cross paths but never to the point now where he knows who i am and i of course i know who the heck he is but <laughs> you know now you know i'll see him backstage and he'll be like oh hey brian and i'm like i'm always just like bro what 
dog. Like, <laughs> it's wild to say, did the best wrestler in the world just talk to me right now? What the? <laughs> yep. But nah, it's cool, man. It's definitely a full circle moment. Like I said, I met him at the Ring of Honor taping in Texas for the first time. And, you know, eventually one day I'll be standing across the ring from him one day. So we'll, uh... Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Who will see? I can't wait. Yeah, Will. No, I, the, look, the, <laughs> the gears have been turning the last like three minutes of this conversation thinking about. I, I, I'm just gonna say this: you said you have that uh, that program. Yeah, bring that to TV one week, dude. Oh, for sure. Oh, I am. I'm gonna bring it, man. I got a bunch. Of like the gears are turning right now. This has been amazing. This has been an incredible conversation, and I'm so glad that we got to do this. I'm so glad you got to be on AEW Unrestricted. I'm so glad that Brian Keith is all elite. It's been something that I think all of us have been waiting for for a very long time, and uh, this last year of getting to see you go from wrestling hangman on Rampage to uh, standing in the middle of the ring with Tony Schiavone and that graphic on the screen, and there's going to be so much more to come for Brian Keith here in AEW. And there's so much more. AEW, you can catch. AEW Unrestricted is available every Thursday on your favorite podcast platforms, and we've got video editions of this show available every Monday on our YouTube channel. AEW Dynamite airs every Wednesday on TBS, 8 p.m. We've got AEW Rampage every Friday at 10 p.m. We've got AEW Collision every Saturday, 8 p.m. on TNT. We've also got Ring of Honor available every Thursday. Watch ROH.com. That's available on Honor Club. This here has been AEW Unrestricted. I'm Will Washington. That's Aubrey Edwards, our special guest, Brian Keith. Thank you for being here. We will see you next time. Have a great day. Peace. Bye. Throw your hands up, let me see you Unrestricted, got the house now We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down Got that big space pumping, make them bounce now Blousing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out